There's a million things that I could say about your pastors and your leaders, but I'll just tell Pastor Matt that I love this church because this is a church where 1 Corinthians talks about uh, it's a desire for anyone that plants a church or leads a congregation that the people can go from a milk to meat. He talks about milk to meat, and he says, hey, you know, it's okay if these people haven't got it yet. They're still on milk, but when you get to meat, it's not okay to be like, and he explains all these things, and I told Pastor Matt, because I listen to sermons all the time, and this week when he asked me to share, I listened to a bunch of sermons, so saw your seven uh, deadly sins, saw some Easter messages, saw one of Pastor Chris's, and, and so I told Pastor Matt, you're preaching truth in Pleasanton, like, you're, you're, not, you're not just teaching sermons that are just like motivational or that are just happy-go-lucky. I mean, for gosh sakes, you guys talked about gluttony last week. You know, like th this is not just some soft stuff. This is, you're actually going from milk to meat. And I'll tell you this, that is a blessing to be in a church that's going, hey, let's go deep in some areas. Let's speak some truth into some areas. I mean, I can't tell you how blessed you guys are, and, and I love pastors and leaders that say that in a culture that says, hey, don't, don't, don't offend, preach very nice and easy. You want people to come back, so make sure every week you have a smile on your face and no one leaves offended, where then, you know, last week, you're like, all right, let's talk about gluttony, all the verse about gluttony, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, or Pastor Matt talked about, like, let's talk about the unholy trinity, and I'm like, oh man, this is, this is rich preaching. This is reach teaching. So you guys are blessed for that. Not I could talk about how cool kids club looks and all that stuff like that. I mean, that stuff is state of the art. But the fact that you guys get to learn the word of God every single week in a practical way and, it, and it's rich, I mean, that is a blessing. So I pray that I get to just add to that level of teaching that you guys get regularly because um, it is an incredible opportunity to be in a house that says, hey, Let's preach. Let's, let's dig in the word of God and learn the word of God. So Lord willing, I'll be able to share with that with you today. So if you do me a favor, if you have your Bibles, you can uh, pull your Bible out. Uh, my teaching style, though, I was raised in a black church. So if you want to amen me or shout me down or anything like that, feel free to do that. Uh, if you want to be frozen and just give me a nod, you can do that too. I'm comfortable with that as well. Whatever you feel comfortable with. But uh, as I preach excited, one of the things that I, my preaching style is I also like to really teach some verses and break those down. So if it's all right with you, since it's limited and I'm not going to have multiple weeks, I'm going to really just take a couple verses and I'm going to break them down with you guys in a few moments. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Revelation chapter 12? And you know, you're like, oh my gosh, this guy's in the book of Revelation and he's a guest speaker. How much time do we have? <laughs> he only gave me two hours. So I promise I'll get you out of here in time. We're all going to leave you very fast. No, but I'm going to share with you, hopefully, uh, what I believe to be in a massive crux of the book of Revelation. Most people fear reading it. Most people feel approaching it, fear approaching it. But hopefully today, uh, I love this passage of scripture, which we're going to visit, but I hope that it gives you confidence, not only in the life that you're living today, but also the life that one day where we stand before God. And I, because a lot of times we live life day by day and day by day only. And, and that's okay. The Bible does talk about that. The book of James says, don't worry for tomorrow because tomorrow's problems will come. And there's truth in that. But also when you know the reality of the future, when we stand before God, the great celebration that'll take place, that'll help you understand that this is not your worst days, that this isn't your toughest days, that there is a day of celebration where there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more mourning. And so as tough as today or a season you may be in, just know as we trust in the Lord, God is doing a work in your life. He's doing a work in your life. Whether you're in a great season or a tough season, he does a work in your life. So I want you to see this for just a moment. And let me pull up the slide for you. Let's, let me get to that verse. Okay. Here's Revelations chapter 12, verse 10 to 11. I'll read it. We'll pray and we'll dig in. We're going to hang in two verses today. And here's what it says. It says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night before our God. Speaking of Satan, it's one of Satan's things. He just accuses and he accuses and he accuses. And verse 11 says, and they... Speaking of the future church that's in the kingdom of heaven, it says they have conquered him. Conquered who? Satan. They have conquered him by what? The blood of the lamb and by the word 
of their testimony. Okay? For they have loved not their lives even unto death. Can we pray for just a moment? Lord, we thank you so much for this word today, Father God. I thank you, Lord, as we sung in worship today, Father, that the blood of Jesus has given us victory today, God. I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus, God. I thank you that that gives us authority and access and victory, Lord. I thank you for the word that you speak today, Lord. May our hearts be open, may our minds be open, and may the Spirit of God speak to every single person in this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, as you guys can see, as we just read for a few moments, I love to put into perspective that towards the end of creation, and you don't have to understand all of Revelation to understand what's going on. What, what's happening in this moment, and this is talking about future people that are standing before God, which you and I are near and we are included in this moment. And, and there's a moment uh, as we talk about end times and all these things like that, that the church of God is standing before God. And they're celebrating, believers are celebrating that they defeated Satan. They're celebrating this. They're celebrating that they finished well. They're, they're celebrating that on the other side of history and the other side of creation, here we are and we're standing before God. And as they're celebrating that God's battle is finished, what are the two things they celebrate? What are the two things that are brought up that means or shows us why Satan is defeated? The two things are shown is because of the blood of Jesus, it's the work of Jesus on the cross. And the second is, it says the word of their testimony, your testimony. You see, the, 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 the term testimony is simply that message in which God is working in your life. God has redeemed you. The, the story of your life where God is in the middle of it, where Jesus has redeemed you, Jesus has saved you, and, and they look at the enemy being defeated, and there's two things that are built on the crux of it. The work of Jesus... And the work that Jesus has done in your life, the word, the testimony. It's incredible a lot of times when we're looking to see God move in our life, we're looking to see God active in our life, we look for these big, momentous occasions, right? These revival moments, these moments where Jesus comes from your ceiling and he stands and he's glowing and he's talking to you. And we're looking for those type of moments, but we really don't realize that a lot of times in life, life changes Mostly by one word or one phrase. That's where life shifts. Life does not shift in very long, drawn out, climactic moments. They, they, they actually shift with just simple sentences and phrases. So I'm going to read a few sentences and phrases, and you guys tell me if that creates a shift in someone's life, okay? You, many of you guys may recognize some of these. Uh, how about a phrase of something like, will you marry me? I mean... Two words, marry me. Or we, I'm pastor, I do a lot of weddings. Everybody puts tens of thousands of dollars, food, flowers, decor, guests, for one moment where they say, I do. You just spent $50,000 for two words, I do. We could have done that at a park. You could have done that at a backyard. That's, all, that's the only reason why we're all there. The dress is nice, the suit is nice, but if you guys don't say I do, we're, we're all like, what do you mean you got, like, nobody's saying I do? No, we just wanted people to come and celebrate our love. No, you guys better say I do. You guys better seal this deal right now. We're, we're, we're there for five hours for two words. Two words. It, it, it's incredible how much hinges on just those words. And I've done a lot of weddings, and people nowadays are looking at TikTok and Pinterest, and they're adding new ways to get married, but no one has ever said, Pastor, could we leave out the I do part? <laughs> Everybody's switching everything except for those two words. Everybody still wants those two words. Or how about a word like, I love you for the first time? First time I said it to my wife, took her three months to say it back. It's the longest three months of my life. <laughs> For three words. But when she said them, oh man, they were powerful. You, you could have exchanged, you could have had, honestly, you could have had a $50,000 check or those three words that she would have said that I was hoping for and I would have chose those three words any day of the week. Because those words meant everything to me. And they still mean everything to me. You may have heard words like this before. You're hired. Is that not altering? 
after the 50th job interview, <laughs> after the 20th LinkedIn update or LinkedIn said, you find, hey, you're hired. That, that, that changes things, changes things. Or you hear this on the back end, hey, we want to give you full medical coverage. Oh my goodness. The Lord is moving in that moment. Full medical coverage. As those words change things. How about this? You go out to lunch with someone and they say, hey, lunch is on me. Ooh, I wish I knew that on the front end. <laughs> I want to order differently. On you? That's a game changer. That's a game changer. Hey, how about this? Today, you go to a checkout counter and you like something really nice and they say, oh, we forgot to tag it. This is half off. I think, oh, let me do a circle. One more circle. Those words change things. Let me circle back up real quick. See what else there is. How about this? Hey, I'm pregnant. Now, I don't know, I don't know how bad it is for some of y'all, but when you're married, those are exciting words that you want to hear. I don't know about when you weren't married, if you ever heard those, but... But when you're married, that, that is an exciting word. So I don't know what category you would put, I'm pregnant, but I was excited when I heard that from my wife. Or how about, let's take a turn. Not just the exciting ones, but how about this? When you were younger, you had something like, we need to talk. Oh, that's pretty. How about, it's not you, it's me. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's not you, it's me. How about, you ever heard this from your parents growing up, or you as parents have given this, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Yeah. Oh, that one word, disappointed. <laughs> My dad used that on me so many times. It, it stung every single time. How about this? You're being evicted. Or you're fired. Or I can't pay you back. Or being in a doctor's office and hearing the word terminal. Or being somewhere and using the, hearing the D word, divorce. Those are all just words. But they're words that can turn everything. For the positive or the negative, it can set your stature. It could set your standard. It could set your own drive towards God. Positive or negative. So a lot of times what we don't realize is that word, a word, a phrase is so powerful that it can either drive you or it could crush you. So when you think of Revelations chapter 12 and at the end of all creation and God saying that the victory of the lamb is real and then he looks at all of you guys and he says, what do you guys have to say? And the word that you respond with is what Jesus did in your life to save you. That is what God is looking for. God does not say, hey, everything's done. Satan's defeated the work of Jesus. Remind us again how great your 401k is. Remind us one more time what university your children went to. Remind us one more time what cars you have in your driveway. God doesn't care in that moment, though those are great things we can accomplish in life. Those are great standards we can set. But in the moment, you are crying out and saying, for me, it was me saying on 2000, December 2007, Jesus captivated my heart. He won me. He saved me. He delivered me. He gave me freedom. God's saying that's the word that will change lives. That's the testimony that can change lives. You, you could be new to this church and you came on Easter and that's the moment God captivated your heart. In heaven, you will be yelling that day in 2024 where God's goodness and mercy show you. That will be the motivator that you'll look at Satan as Satan is put in his place and say, yeah, you tried to get me. You tried to get my children. You tried to steal my joy, but because of two things, the blood of Jesus and the word of your testimony that has driven you, that has kept you straight. That's why Paul says, finish the, face well, but finish the race well, because it's that driving force that maintains you. But a lot of times we don't always see it because the type of faith we're looking for and the type of life we're looking for is perfect and pristine and having no issues, having no challenges. There's, you know, like I said, I've, I've, I've uh, uh, spent time with Pastor Matt in Israel, but I, prior to things that recently been happening in Israel, every year now I was doing two or three tours. I'd take pastors or I, or I'd take our church did one tour a year. And what I began to do because I notice, uh, if you guys know anything about the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where Jesus prayed before he was turned in by Judas, um, what happened was, is Jesus was praying there. Many people go and take tours there. But over the years, the Orthodox churches and the Catholic churches have basically uh, 
taken over in, in a good way, not in a bad way. They've taken over those areas and they've created these like gorgeous churches. And so the Garden of Gethsemane are like these, these olive trees and everything like that. They're just, they're gorgeous. They water them every day. They clip them every day. And so what I started doing was, because that's not what the garden looked like when Jesus walked it. Like nowadays they have these little like prayer, if you've ever been, they have like prayer paths and they have uplights on the trees. And it's just, it's perfect. It's just perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. I started kind of getting annoyed with that because I'm like, this isn't what it looked like. But if you go about 50 yards up, there's still olive trees, but it's raw and there's weeds growing around and there's trash going around. And so what I started to do was I'll take tours. First, I'll make them walk 50 yards past those churches and I'll take them to a place where, as you can see, I'll take them to this place right here to the left where it's deep hilled, it's grassy, there's weeds, there's, you know, there's kids toys sometimes around. And I'll take people there and I'll read the story of Jesus, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane from there. And when I'm there, people are just kind of like, they're standing and they're looking. And then I go, okay, guys, let me take you to the other place. And then I take them here. And then all of a sudden they're like, Lord, I, just, I see it. I see you. Because in that moment, the manicured, the pristine, now they're saying, oh, now I can express my faith. Now this is what the desire of my faith looks like. That first place you took me to, I couldn't see it, but now I see Jesus. This is the one we see in movies. This is the one we see in TV. No one's showing us this one, but this is more accurate to your faith. This is more accurate to what it is with the walk with God. And oftentimes, when we'll see the end of days and we see God in completion, we'll see this work that he's doing. But in the meantime, till that point, you're walking in this type of life. Many times things aren't manicured, aren't pristine. And we're telling God, God, do something about this. But that is a part of the process. As God is doing a work and giving you a testimony and giving you a word from God and he's developing this moment where you celebrate God in your life at the end of days, it's because you've gone through this and you've stayed faithful. It's because you trusted God through this and you still worshiped him. You still desired him. You still loved him. And so we have to get to a point in our life where we say, God, even when it's not pristine, even when my life is not manicured, even when it's in disarray, I still worship you. I still believe the blood of Jesus is real. I still believe the work of God is real because that is what God is showing us at the end of our days. Because one word can change it all. One moment with God can change it all. It's one moment. And it's one moment where we begin to trust God and we begin to know God and we begin to experience God's love in such a fresh way way. But I'll tell you this, many people that you meet and do life with, they will not fully understand that. It won't make sense to them that even through the toughest of your days that you're trusting God and trusting Jesus. Not everyone will make sense of that. Not everyone will understand that. There was one time uh, last year when uh, I was in Kentucky and I was here with, with my friend Phil. We were in Kentucky. We just landed. It was like midnight. Almost nothing was open. So we go on Yelp, and there's this, like, diner that closes in, like, an hour. And at the time, speaking of gluttony, since October, I've lost 50 pounds. Phil has lost 70 pounds. So, so I'll tell you, messages like that, they work. Because back in October, I was preaching a message to our men about Luke 2.52. Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with man. And at the time, I felt like God said, Adam... I've given you wisdom, I've given you favor, but your stature is terrible. Your health isn't good. And so that got me on this track of wanting to lose weight and get healthy. But because it's a, it's a message, God's word, it's not just transformational. Like the, it'll transform your practical day. That's why I love a sermon like that. But we get to Kentucky. Now, mind you, at the time, I'm still 50 pounds heavier, Phil 70 pounds heavier. So we're looking for some Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> So we go into this restaurant that said they were open. Lady looks like she's closing. We walk in. We said, hey, are you open? She said, if, if y'all are eating, we'll be open. I didn't know what that meant, but I thought, okay, like you say yes or no. But we're like, yeah, we'll sit down. <laughs> like, I, think, I told him, like, I think once we stop eating, she's going to kick us out. So I don't know what that means. 
So we sit down, and she could tell we're not from around. So she says, where, where are you all from? We say, oh, we're from the Los Angeles area. We're from California. As she's handing out the menu, she goes, I'm sorry, with genuine, genuine sadness. She goes, I'm sorry, we don't have any salads on the menu. <laughs> and we're like, and we look at each other. And then I look at her, and I'm like, do we look like we eat salads? <laughs> Like, she goes, well, you guys are from California. Don't, doesn't everyone only eat salads in California? She's genuine. She did not think we had greasy food in California. She had no idea. And she goes, I'm sorry. I, 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 we go, no, yeah, we have greasy food in California. We, 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 we have tons of stuff. We, and she goes, really? She's now like blown away. Really? And, and we explained to her things we eat, like burritos and stuff like that. And she's like, oh, my goodness. Well, you'll love this stuff on our menu. And she talks, and she goes, I'm sorry. I just, I've never been to California. I assumed that you guys just ate salads every day. <laughs> and we're going, no, that, that's not the diet. And so then we order all the KFC and all that kind of stuff like that. And she was so impressed that we were willing to eat it as unhealthy as it was. But the only reason why she didn't understand why we don't eat salads or why we do eat salads is because she's never been there. She's never been there. So she's completely operating off of assumption. And there are times in your life where you will meet people who are not believers and they don't understand why you're even here today. They don't understand your Sunday mornings you spend going to church. They don't understand why there are days of your life that you prioritize your faith and your development in Christ. Why you would go to a men's motorcycle ride. Why would you come off us? They won't understand that. And it's not because they, don't, they mean something. It's because they've never been there. They've never been to a place where they needed God so bad that they needed God's word so bad that they needed the work of Jesus so bad that they were willing to walk away from it all just to experience God's grace. It's because they've never been there. And you know once you've been there, there's no turning back. That's God's grace. That's God's mercy in your life. And so you will have family at times in your life who don't understand why you won't gossip or why you won't retaliate or why you won't act a certain way that the world is acting. They won't understand it. And they'll mock you. They'll joke with you. They'll make fun of you. But it's just because they've never been there. Never been there. So I want you to see that through the love and the blood of Jesus, I want to share this verse with you guys. First Peter chapter 118, we see this work. Let me pull it up. I think that's it. All right. First Peter 118, it says this. It says, knowing that you were ransomed from your feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Amen. You see, for me, I often struggle with this concept, not because I struggle with the idea that Jesus died for me or Jesus died on the cross, but it's in order to accept this verse over your life, you have to recognize that you've done nothing to earn your salvation. Right. That you, you, you didn't add to this. Right. You can't gloat. You can't show off. Even when you're in heaven and you're redeemed, it says that we will celebrate off of the word of our testimony. And what's the testimony? The testimony isn't your accomplishments. The testimony isn't what you, you know, I went to church every single week. With, I never missed a Sunday. I went to every Monday prayer. I joined every small group. That is not what you're saying to people. You're pointing to Jesus. You're going, it's all him. He found me where I was at and he saved me. It's all him. And the reality that it's the work of Jesus means that you and I have to get to a place where we fully receive that work for our lives. You know, there was a great pastor who once said this. He said, most Christians do not have fellowship with God. They have fellowship with each other about God. And we have to get to a place in our life and our faith where we start having that personal fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords where you develop your testimony in a way that when you are in heaven, you are reflecting on the time spent with God. Not the time spent in just a neighborhood group. Not the time spent in church. That time spent that was shared in your life, like Pastor Matt said at the opening, when you're in a place, a desolate place, and you're spending time with God. 
You're talking to God. You're praying with God. You're communing with God. You're building up that infrastructure for your faith that says when storm comes, when trial comes, your, the richness of your relationship with God is not just built off of the great relationships you have. It's built on the great relationship with God that you have. Because in heaven, that is what you will celebrate. I won't look at Phil and be like, bro, I'm here because of you, man. You prayed for me. No, 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 no. I won't be there because Phil prayed for me. I won't be there because Phil held my arm. That is part of the human condition of church that God has blessed us with to finish strong. But when I'm in heaven, once again, God, this is all you. This is all you. It's a celebration of God's faithfulness in your life. That that word, when God came to you and spoke to you, it changed your heart and changed your life. There was one time I was in, a, 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 in 20, January of 2020, I was in Amsterdam and I had to do some uh, work for, for a business I was working with. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know how to read the language in, in Amsterdam, in Netherlands. So they have all these like parking signs in different languages. I couldn't read them. And so I had a rental car. I was there for five days. When I got back to the States, Herc sent me this, this envelope that said, you incurred a hundred traffic violations <laughs> while you were in Amsterdam. <laughs> Because I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't read the language. And so I begin to read on the bottom of the paper. And the bottom of paper, it showed the price of all of the traffic fines together. And the, uh, so I'm thinking, oh, I got to pay this. It's, crazy. it's in the thousands of dollars. I'm like, oh, this is a mess. And then I look at the bottom and it says, this fine will incur the next time you step foot on Netherlands soil. Well, guess what? <laughs> Your boy is never going to Netherlands again. That's one country off the bucket list. You will never see my face again. I'm, ne I'm never showing up. I'm not going. And, and in our walk with God, that place that God has taken to, that he saved you, that he's redeemed you, that the blood of Jesus has been applied, we have to get to a place that when Satan, it says the accuser is in heaven, and there's a point, he goes back and forth, and he accuses you, and he accuses you, and he accuses you. He says, there's going to be a day where that all ends. He says, Satan, that's enough. No more accusing my people. We have to get to a place in our faith that says, God, where you have saved me, where you have redeemed me, I'm, I won't visit that place anymore. Yeah. I'm not visiting that place. The reason why we keep get, getting payment after payment after payment is because we keep living in sin and habit and sin and habit and depression and anxiety of places that have taken us where God's saying, I want to give you freedom from those areas. I want to take you to places where you're not being. The blood of Jesus is applicable to all of those areas. The question is, will we receive that word? Yeah. Well, will we take that word and say, God, I did, your goodness and mercy so much, God. You have covered my fines for so long. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to visit there anymore. I'm not going to touch that place anymore. Because the word of God and the testimony of God in your life has done such a work that I say, God, I'm not going back. Jesus, you ransomed me. You paid the price. You paid it all. I thank you, Lord. And we got to get to a place where we trust God in our faith. You see, the next verse I want to share with you is how the word of your testimony has power. Never lose the fact that what God has done in your life, there is authority and there is power behind. And God is actively, actively, regularly giving you a testimony in your life. God is actively giving you freedom. God is actively giving you deliverance. And those are meant to be weapons against the enemy, weapons against thought, weapons against pain to know that God is doing a work in your life. And it says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone. Everyone. The world does not overcome you. You overcome the world. Not because of you, because, not because of your own standard, because God has given you a birthright into his family. You become a child of God. And it says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is that? Our faith. Our faith. Your faith is the weapon. Your faith is the thing that gives you victory. Victory. That is the driving force. That is the vehicle. Hebrews 11.1 1, that says that faith are the things hoped for concerning God, but yet you can't see. It's been yet to be fulfilled. 
That is trust. That is faith. And he says, that is the vehicle to overcoming. And that is the vehicle that at the end of the day, when we stand before God, you will celebrate that that faith, that driving force of trusting God and the Spirit's work in your life is where you're at today is because God is doing a work in your life and you trust it. Even in times you can't see it. There are times in my life that it just, I'm sometimes, where God, where are you at? But that's how Peter felt when he was in the water in the storm. He's thinking he's walking on water for a little bit. And then he says, Jesus, where are you at? And Jesus goes, I'm right here. He extends his hand. But it's the act that he wanted Peter to shout, Jesus, where are you? Jesus shows himself. Here I am. God will show himself faithful in your life if you look to him, if you cling to him, if you trust him, if you hope in him. That's God's desire for your life is that through the refinement process at the end of the days, you say, Jesus, it was all you, and you celebrate the testimony of God's goodness in your life. That's what God wants to work in you. That's what God wants to place in you. There was a time in my life when I was in college, and I was at a college that was really known for its biblical rigor. It was known for its, its hard approach to studying the Bible. And so a lot of people, most people went there because they wanted to be very impressive saying that they went to that university because the standards were really high and the processes were really high. And so most students there, they were developing knowledge about Jesus, knowledge about the word of God. And they were very braggadocious about what they knew and how they knew about it. Well, I had a professor that at the time the church I'm pastoring now, which is the church my dad uh, uh, had planted and started for 30 years now, uh, just a couple months ago, I had the honor of taking over as the new senior pastor. And after 30 years of faithfulness that my dad planted and placed that ministry. But when I was in my 20s, I'd left my dad's church for a season because my dad believed in active healings and signs of God and moves of God. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't believe in that. I was going through my own thing. And so I was in an area of my life and my professor tells me, hey, Adam, we're doing a paper about churches, what they do outside of the church to love the community. Can you do a paper on your dad's church? And I said, I, me and my dad, we don't really talk about church anymore. It, it, I, it wouldn't go good. And he's like, would you do it for me? Everybody here, they go to the same three churches. You know, he does this whole thing. So finally, I agree. Everyone goes up in the class for their presentation, and they all share that on Thanksgiving, they all do a food outreach. He saves me purposely for last. And I go up and I go with this five-page piece of paper. And I'm like, oh, on, I'm doing my project on my dad's church. And they're like, oh, okay. And so I get to the end of the paper and the page. And I'm, and I'm sharing on Mondays they do this. On Tuesday do this. Thursday do I'm sharing something for pretty much every single day. I'm sharing something my dad does. And the man who's a bit older, he goes up. He was in his late 70s. He comes up after I shared everything my dad's church does. And the professor looks at me and he says, Adam, I want to encourage you with this thought. And he says, when you get my age and you get to the end of your life, the last thing I want for you is that you be known for how much you know about Jesus. I'd rather you be known for how much you look like Jesus. And he looked at the class. He said, because everyone here, you guys know a lot about Jesus, but his dad looks like Jesus. He said, that's the difference of our faith. That's the driving force of our faith. And the whole room just absolutely crumbled in on itself. And I went up to my professor and I said, hey, you think I should go back to my dad's church? And he says, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but that man looks like Jesus. I said, I get it. You see, the testimony of what God is developing in your life is so that you look like Jesus. You love like Jesus. You forgive like Jesus. You pray like Jesus. You trust like Jesus. God is developing. It says that you bear the image of Christ every single day. Oh, it's so impressive to have scripture memorized. It's so impressive to know more worship songs than you do secular songs. That is so impressive. Really, it is. We celebrate that thing. But it's God's desire that you look more like him every single day. That in heaven, he looks at all of us and he sees the work of Jesus in every person's life. And it's one word that can do that. And it's the work of God 
that can do that. So instead of the broken world that we see, instead of the hurting world that we see, I would love to offer you some words that you can find in the Word of God that would give you hope today, that would allow you to continue to look more like Jesus. So I'd love to offer you some of these words, the words from God that are this, you're free, you're accepted, you're healed, you're loved, you're enough, you're forgiven, you're alive, you're safe, and you are home. Those are the words that the word of God, there are scriptures associated for all of those things that you could look up and you can find that through those words, those are the words that God can speak over your life. Those are the words that can transform you. Those are the words that can develop you into a new creation. Those are the words that at the end of days, like the book of Revelation says, you will see these things at work in people's lives. You will hear the testimonies of people saying, I was once addicted to this and then I was free because of Jesus. I was once broken from this because of what happened to me at a child, but then I was free from Jesus. I once was afraid of the world because of this that's happened, but I'm alive because because of Jesus. I once thought that I was a no one. I didn't value myself or my body, but God told me I'm enough. Those things are going to be words that you're going to hear upon millions of people that day in heaven. And you too will have the very same word of God active in your life. So I love to pray for you today as we begin to close. And if you feel like you're far from a relationship with God, I just want to invite you today in this place to get to a place where you are reconciled back to Jesus Get to a place where one day you will stand before the Father and you will hear these faithful words that you'll know that you're victorious, not because of anything you did, but because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the beauty is that three days later, we know that Jesus resurrected to show us that Satan, sin, and death is put in its place under the grace of God. So would you join me in bowing your head and closing your eyes today? I just want to invite you in this moment that I'm going to pray for us. And then at the end, I'm just going to ask everyone, join me in repeating this prayer out loud. Some people are going to be saying this for the first time in their life, confessing faith in Jesus Christ. And the prayer is not the thing that saves us. God is already at work in your life. This prayer affirms the work that God is already doing in our life. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to have us all repeat this prayer together. God, we thank you so much for what you've done today in this place, Lord. I pray you continue to take an active role in every single person's life, that when they get to the end of their life, they can celebrate your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, and your righteousness, God. We thank you that your spirit has filled this place, Lord. Transform our hearts today, God. Help us to know you, love you, and serve you in a rich way in our life, God. We thank you for the word of God that transforms us in every way, in every possible place, God. May we not look for these great, grandiose moments, but may we look towards those moments where the Spirit of God is just speaking to us, like right now, God. It's those moments that will change us. And so if you're in here, would you all join me in praying out loud this confession of faith, affirming the work of Jesus. Would you say, Dear Lord Jesus, in this moment, I confess you as Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. I trust in the cross. I believe in the resurrection. And today, I commit to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, family. Thank you for letting me share with you. You know, I want us to look at this. Uh, can we put that last slide up real fast? You know, one of the things that, that as we hung out in Montana, the, the person that oversees the, the retreat center, they, they threw out this statement to us. They said, hey, when, when you're here, you're going to be tempted to, to get what you want. But I want to encourage you to get what you need. And maybe you can't receive every word, but you can receive one word. And so I just want to take a moment and just have just... Just, just gaze upon this. What do you need from God today? Don't be fooled by the simplicity. As Pastor Adam said, sometimes it's in the simplest of moments, the simple phrase that packs a huge punch can change everything. Which one of these words do you need today?
Would you put your hands out? Let me just pray for us as we go. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we put our hands out in a posture of receiving today. I know one of the hardest things in my life has been is, is being able to receive some of the things that you've spoken over me. Lord, I've had to wrestle through that I'm not worthy. I don't know. I... But Lord, today we receive your words over our life that we are overcomers. That, Lord, our faith is the driving force, God. It's impossible to please you without faith. And so today, Lord, we just choose to receive this word. And we pray, God, that we would never be the same. How just one word can change everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So good. Come on, can we stand to our feet? Can we thank Pastor Adam this morning? Thank you, my brother.